So as we uh, continue our walk through the, the book of Isaiah, I, I was looking through the passage for today, and the one thing that came to my mind was, what, for you as an individual, what has life been like to this point? What are the experiences, the expectations that you have built into your life? And each of us are different because we each have a, a, a little different background. Uh, it's not just because you live next door to somebody that you're going to be just like them. It's more built on the experiences, expectations, the people that you surround you with. And, and so what I you know, start off with, you know, before you kind of fir- firmly entrench yourself on wh- what you would fill that blank in with, let me give you two examples of uh, some people. And, and, and I will be up front. They're over here. They're on opposite ends of the spectrum. But on the first hand, we've got one person who has... Uh, have had, has had a really good life. In fact, you would call it a, a perfect life. They, they were born into a, a good marriage, a good family, loving, supportive. They went to a good school. They had good friends. They, you know, the friends, the good friends, you know, the ones I'm talking about, the ones that lift you up and they don't push you down or they don't use you. They moved on. They had a good education in college. They met Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright got married, had good kids, a good life, a good job. They found a job that not only benefited them uh, financially, but emotionally. Because, I, you know, I, I don't know about y'all, but a, a good job is emotionally stabilizing. So this person has, in, in some regards, has got it all, right? Now, on the other hand, you've got another person. Now, this person was born into not such, such great circumstances. Maybe those circumstances are due to a split family, drugs, divorce, alcohol, abuse, whatever the thing is, they've 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 their experience is totally different from the first person. This those experiences have led this person to be a, a little anti authority. Maybe they are fearful. Maybe they've gone to school and instead of being uh, a positive experience. They've they fought against that authority of the teachers. Are they? It was just a negative experience. They and then that led to even more bad decisions, surrounding themselves with bad friends, bad circumstances. They've suffered through life. Maybe those the, that foundation just was crumbly. It led them to make bad decisions. Maybe it was a child out of wedlock. Maybe it was a an abusive relationship. Uh, that they endured because they were just trying to fill that hole of a parent that wasn't there. But with that person, overall, just a bad experience. And like I said, on both ends of these, you know, these are the opposite ends of the spectrum. Nothing about them uh, was alike. And, and probably for each of us in here, I can't speak for all of you, but most of us probably fall somewhere in the middle, right? You know, we, we, we have good things and we have things that we suffer through. There's nothing about life that is without suffering. I think all these bumper stickers that say life is grand and all this kind of stuff is, is kind of missing the point because there is suffering that and, and bad things that come across us in life. And, and so what I'd like to do today is to concentrate, is to take a look at, I'm not, I don't want to get into a conversation on how to make good decisions uh, you can go to Books a Million or turn on your TV and get all the self-help uh, advice that you want. But what I want you to focus on today through the story of Moab is the fact that what, ha- what does happen when you have to face those sufferings? How do you make those decisions? And one of the chief culprits in that process, one of the biggest things that inhibit us from making the right decision in many cases is pride. Pride is one of those things that just ekes its way into every aspect of our life. And so by looking at Isaiah 15, so if you'd like to turn in your Bible to Isaiah 15 or turn on your Bible, whichever version you've got, uh, you know, feel free to go ahead and turn to Isaiah 15. We're also going to be flipping over Jeremiah 48. So uh, if, for those of you with the paper Bible, you know, put a finger in Jeremiah 48. But, uh, but 
So today what I want us to really take a look at <clears throat> is to see how in the story of the Moabites, how even when faced with all the suffering and everything that they go through, they could not humble themselves to God. And how they could not move themselves to, to put their faith in a God that actually could solve their problems simply because they had to have it their way. They, had, they just couldn't move on. So if you would turn with me to Isaiah 15, and we'll begin reading there. We're going to be going through 15 and 16, so we've got quite a bit to go through. But, but again, focus on what pride, how you can read pride throughout some of this. Now, you won't see the pride until the second part, but let's focus on the first part, which is chapter 15. An oracle concerning Moab. Because Ar of Moab is laid waste in the night, Moab is undone. Because Kir of Moab is laid waste in the night, Moab is undone. He has gone up to the temple and to Dabon, to the high places to weep. Over Nebo and over Medeba, Moab wails. On every head is baldness, every beard is shorn. In the streets they wear sackcloth. On the housetops and in the squares everyone wells and melts in tears. Heshbon and Alela cry out. Their voice is heard as far as Jahaz. Therefore the armed men of Moab cry aloud. His soul trembles. My heart cries out for Moab. Her fugitives flee to Zoar, to Eglath Shalashiah. For at the ascent of Luith, they go up weeping. On the road to Horonam, they raise a cry of destruction. The waters of Nimrim are a desolation. The grass is withered, the vegetation fails, the greenery is no more. Therefore, the abundance they have gained and what they have laid up, they carry away over the brook of the willows. For a cry has gone around the land of Moab, for her wailing reaches to Eglam. Her wailing reaches to Beer Elam. For the waters of Dabon are full of blood. For I will bring upon Dabon even more a lion for those of Moab who escape, for the remnant of the land. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I, it's kind of depressing. <laughs> it, there's not much uplifting to that passage. Uh, let's, you know, but we're, what we're reading about here is Judah's neighbor, Moab. And a little background with Moab. Basically, they, like uh, the Philistines that we talked about last week, were uh, asked to be a part of a, a group, an alignment against Assyria by Egypt. Egypt was trying to bring forward all these countries and go against Assyria. And so Moab joined the fight. In 755, roughly BC, you know, they, they've, even though God was not in, in uh, agreement with this, that is the decision that they made. They moved uh, against Assyria. And at that point, it's interesting because then you start seeing that what happens when you oper operate outside of God's will. The mention of Dabon, Dabon was the capital of Moab. And the mention there in verse 2, uh, I think verse 2 or 3, it was talking about uh, going to the high places. The high places are where the false gods, the temples to the false gods were located. So here you've got all the Moabites because the, the invasion of the Assyrians is sweeping into their country. And they are fleeing to their capital city, to the temple and the high places to go to their false god, the false god of Chemosh. And it's that point that they get there and they start to realize, oh, wow, we might have backed the wrong guy. And so they go there fleeing, looking for answers, looking for safety, looking for their God to protect them. But as you can imagine, there were no answers in those high places. So you, look, you move forward in the passage. You read about the destruction of the cities of Ar and Kir. These cities that, you, and you can just, as you go through the passage, you can just see a sweeping hand moving across the land of Moab. The destruction is immense. You can hear the cries, the wailing, the tears that are just flowing 
from the anguish, from the destruction that these people are experiencing. You can feel it, right? When you read that passage, you can feel that anguish that they are experiencing through the destruction of their homes, their properties, their lands, their crops. Everything is just being decimated. And it's at that point that we see, you see in verse 5, where, where God, or through Isaiah, says, talks about how He is weeping over the destruction that he is seeing on these people. This, this destruction that, you know, through this scripture you can see it's, it's identifying all these cities, uh, you know, Elilah, Jahaz, Zor, Eglash, Shalishia, all of those names that are hard to pronounce. Took me a week, so, and I'm still not sure I got them right. But the thing is, is you see all that destruction. It's going over. The way, if you were actually looking at a map, it's the way that it's painted through the scripture. It's chaotic. It's not, it's not just going down in a straight line. It's chaotic. So it adds to the, the depth of the chaos, the destruction that's going on. These people are confused. They are, they are just frantic with fear from the destruction. And so they continue to just run south they run, and, and to the west until they bump into Judah. They're right there on the boundary, and, and it's amazing. Again, God, even though God is the one that is orchestrating this punishment, this destruction on these people that are following a false god, that even in the midst of that punishment, God is showing sympathy. He is showing understanding, and He is prayer, just wishing that they would just wake up through all this destruction, that they would lift their head to Him instead of running to their false gods and running to their own devices to get away from the destruction that they have. You know, Moab has a strong lineage to God. Moab, after all, was named after the son, and this is not such a favorable comparison, but he was Moab was named after the son of the incestuous son born to Lot. So there's a direct link between the 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 story of Israel and Judah with Moab, there was a link there that they have just walked away from, mainly do, and you go through and you study, you see where they just wanted to do things their own way, not God's way. And so God even, but it's important to see, and this is a primary point as we move forward, is even in the midst of, of His hand laying judgment on them, He weeps. He cries for His people. They're His people even though they have turned away from Him. And it's at this point that we begin to see a turn. We see in chapter 16 where Isaiah is presenting to uh, the people of Moab, introducing them to the fact that they need to take another route. So if you'll turn with me, and we're, we're, we're going to move into chapter 16 here. In verses 1 through 5, the first couple of verses is, is Isaiah instructing or talking about how Moab should go to Judah for help. And then you see in verses 3 through 5 where uh, uh, God is then talking to Judah and telling them to help. So pay attention as we, as we go through that. Beginning in verse 1, Send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah by way of the desert to the mount of the daughter of Zion. Like fleeing birds, like a scattered nest, so are the daughters of Moab at the fords of the Arnon. And here's where the, the conversation shifts to Judah. Give counsel. Grant justice. Make your shade like night at the height of noon. Shelter the outcast. Do not reveal the fugitive. Let the outcast of Moab sojourn among you. Be a shelter them, to them from the destroyer. For when the oppressor is no more and destruction has ceased and he who tramples underfoot has vanished from the land, then a throne will be established in steadfast love and on it will sit in faithfulness in the tent of David, one who judges and seeks justice and is swift to do righteousness. So God's hope here is like he's instructing them. Hey guys, take a lamb, go to Judah. Sacrifice it to the give that as a gift. Ask, just ask them 
to let you come into their boundaries, to be protected by them. These are your kinfolk, so to speak. Just go to them. However, as we will see as we continue, they, it falls on deaf ears. God also instructs them to, to, to move, to just go, just go knock on that door. I, you know, for instance, I, the way I, I envision is Judah sitting here just like this. God is instructing you to just extend your hand and welcome them in. Bring in what you would consider to be maybe people that have been in some sort enemies. But these are people that I want you to welcome. But the problem is that the Moabite people refuse the help. They turn away from it because they're pride. And see, that's where we can see the effect of pride. Even in the midst of their destruction, they refuse to help. Even in the midst of being wiped off the planet, they refuse that help. And so it is that pride that God is bringing punishment upon. You can go through the passages. I mentioned uh, Jeremiah 48. You can also go to Ezekiel 25 to see how God's uh, viewpoint on what pride is. Because the, one, the interesting thing is, is there's no particular God putting His finger on and saying this is what it is. It's, it's really covered overall in just the, the one name of pride. But that, you can see it in their decision making. You can see it, uh, if you would, uh, turn to Ezekiel 25, 8-11. You can see just what it will bring upon them. Ezekiel 25, 8 through 11. It's a shorter version of this whole big story that we're reading, but it says, Thus says the Lord God, because Moab and Sarah said, Behold, the house of Judah is like all the other nations. Therefore, I will lay open the flank of Moab from the cities, from its cities on the frontier, the glory of the country. Uh, Beth, Jeshemoth, Baal, Menon, and Kiriah, Bame, sorry. I will give it along with the Ammonites to the people of the east as a possession. He's handing over Moab, just handing him over. That the Ammonites may be remembered no more among the nations, and I will execute judgments upon Moab. Then they will know that I am the Lord. He's bringing judgment on them because of their pride. They're, they're turning away from him and their refusal of following his will. So then we move forward through chapter 16 back in Isaiah, and here we see more about the pridefulness that Moab has. Read with me from chapter 16, verses 6 through 13. We have heard of the pride of Moab. How proud is he? Of his arrogance, his pride, and his insolence, in his idle boasting, he is not right. Therefore, let Moab well for Moab, let everyone well. Mourn, utterly stricken for the raisin cakes of Kirharesh, for the fields of Heshbon languish and the vine of Sama. The lords of the nations have struck down its branches, which reach to Jazir and stray to the desert. Its shoots spread abroad and passed over the sea. Therefore I weep with the weeping of Jazir, for the vine of Sibma. I drench you with my tears, O Heshbon and Elele. For over your summer fruit and your harvest, the shout has ceased. And joy and gladness are taken away from the fruitful field and in the vineyards. No songs are sung, no cheers are raised. No treader treads out wine in the presses. I have put an end to the shouting. Therefore, my inner parts moan like a lyre for Moab and my innermost self for Kir Haresh. And when Moab presents himself... When he wearies himself on the high place, again, the place where the false idols are, when he comes to his sanctuary to pray, he will not prevail. This is the word that the Lord spoke concerning Moab in the past, but now the Lord has spoken, saying, in three years, like the years of a hired worker, the glory of Moab will be brought into contempt in spite of its great multitude, and those who remain will be very few and feeble." You can go to Jeremiah and, and, and see even more 
about how God uh, labels their pride. Uh, again, Jeremiah 48, and I'm going to jump this. I, I, I don't think we need to read the whole passage, but uh, verse 7 you read in uh, Jeremiah 48, For because you trusted in your works and your treasures, you also shall be taken. That's him talking to Moab. You also see in verse 26, Make him drunk because he magnified himself against the Lord. Verse 29 through 30, We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud of his loftiness, his pride, his arrogance, the haughtiness of his heart. I know his insolence, declares the Lord. His boasts are false. His deeds are false. And then, of all things, then it comes to the judgment, which you see in verse 42. Moab shall be destroyed and be no longer a people because he magnified himself against the Lord. I always find it intriguing, when, especially in the, pro, in the books of the prophets, where you can find these overlapping descriptions and, and things, the support that shows the reinforcement of God's purpose for these stories. And it's always good that we, uh, that we read through that chapter of Isaiah. One of the best stories, best things that I learned in my seminary studies, and some of you may have learned this in church, but it, you know, it got reinforced for me in seminary, which is the, the, the story of Christ through the Old Testament. And here in Isaiah 16, we can see the picture, the, the foundation being established on the seed of Judah will, sal- will redemption be found. Verse 16, I mean, chapter 16, it states you know, uh, earlier that the throne will be established. It's amazing how even the story of Jesus is being talked about right here in the middle of all this destruction, in the middle of all this wrath. God is preparing a path. He's preparing a way for a remnant to be born or to be renewed uh, through the future coming of Christ. Our belief in the salvation offered through Christ is what we are about. But unfortunately, right here in our area, in our world, there's a lot of people that turn against that opportunity. We turn against the wisdom of Scripture. We turn against the Word of God. We refuse that gift, that open hand, that God is sitting right there with His hand wide open to each of us, just like He did with Judah, extending their extension of friendship and protection to the Moabites. But unfortunately... Just like the Moabites, for many of us, our pride gets in the way. Our pride prevents us from coming to God and humbling ourselves and saying, you know what, I messed up. I did not follow you. I did this or that, you know, whatever it may be, but I, we refuse to humble ourselves to God, just like the Moabites. And it's unfortunate that we have that we, we continue to run to our false idols, and they're numerous. But what I'd like to go through now is just some general applications on what, how can we prevent pride from indwelling itself in us? How can we prevent pride from overtaking our lives? And I think the very first thing, and I know it may sound like a lot of common sense, because a lot of these are the what I call the, the Holy Grail of being a Christian, which is this is what you ought to do. But I am surprised sometimes at how often we slip away from these things. So the first thing I would say is you seek to know God's will. Now what that means is going to Scripture. You go to Scripture. You read your Bible. Find out what the Scriptures say about whatever it may be that you're going against. God's Word is infallible. It has no error. So why would you go anywhere else? Now, a word of caution, because I know this is something that I've bumped into before, which is instead of going to the Word of God as their key source, people will go to uh, other Christian living books or devotionals, and those are great supplements. Do not get me wrong. But when it gets to 
the true word of God, there is no problem. There is no error. There's no point of opinion that's different. It's God's word. And it is what drives and directs us through our lives. I, I know uh, when I started seminary and, and my pastor uh, at the time sat me down and, and at that time we, I, I, I probably, I know y'all know I drink a lot of coffee, but I drank a lot of coffee back then because I think he and I were together all the time. And, and I just remember his advice. His advice was not what commentary set to go get to prep me for seminary. It wasn't, uh, you know, what seminary to even go to. But his advice to me, and he told me, this is what's going to get you through the next three years of your life. He said, do not, in the pursuit of your studies, in reading all the mountains of books that you have out to have to do, do not neglect the reading of Scripture. And, and for those of us that have been there, it's hard to do. Right, Ben? You get, you get locked in on your studies and, and your life and everything else, and then the next thing you do, the Bible's over here. But that's true for everyone. We get busy with life and we forget. We forget what the foundation... Oh, my Bible's over here. Sorry. But, uh, no, water bottle, Bible. Uh, but the Bible is the source, the Word of God that we should go to. It's, it's not about going to self-help books at all. It's about finding a, a meaningful plan for your reading and sticking to it. So I encourage you to stay. And if you're one of those that has finished the Bible ten times, read it an eleventh time. Read it again. Because I tell you, the one thing that I have been just totally shocked by every year, whether I read a passage one year ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, is that I'll open it today and see something totally different. Because something in my life might have changed. So read the Scriptures. Go through it. Nurture it. Make it a part of of your life. We have that Bible reading plan out, out out on the counter or there's numerous other ones. I encourage you make that a part of your life. The second thing and this is actually probably in my opinion a very close second to the first one. Seek godly mentorship, seek godly partnerships. There is nothing better than Christian fellowship when it comes to going through life. There is nothing more important than having someone there that can have a strong influence on you. And if it's someone that is that you have truly opened yourself to, they and, and you have totally said, you know what, I want you to do this for me, then they have the best insight of saying, you know what, there's your pride. They have that ability to see you for what you really are and to eliminate that pride, whatever, whatever it is, a fear or whatever it is, they will help you identify that and move past it. It's important that you have those. And this is not simply for people. You don't want to just go grab somebody off the street that says they're a Christian. You want to see someone who has walked the walk and talked the talk, right? You want to see not only do they show up on church on Sunday, but are they, are they really living the Scriptures? Are they teaching their family? Do you see the, the Word of God, the Word of Jesus implemented in their family lives? And especially for those of us with children, those, that's important. We want to see that foundation built for our family. So you look to those that have experienced it and went through it. Godly counsel uh, is not just self-help, you know. Uh, in fact, I, I, I firmly believe that uh, the majority of what is considered self-help these days is anti-Christian. Because the whole idea of self-help means that you think you can do it. So I'm not going to sit here and discourage you from reading some of that because some of it, there's, there's good and bad, you know, it's out there. But be mindful of what those self-help books do because if it puts it all on you, then you're missing the point. You've got to go to God to direct you and to push you through whether it's your business, your career, your schooling, whatever it may be, your family life, go to the Scriptures and go to God for that godly counsel. Rely on that mentor. Rely on that person who you have opened the door to to say, you know what, you're a screw-up. I've been lucky enough to have a friend of mine now for 22-plus years. And we met when we weren't so Christian. <laughs> 
I'm not t- sharing any of those stories here today. But he's been with me through thick or thin. We found God and then we pulled each other through all the different sufferings. But I have my when I sit down with him for coffee or for for a meal, it's all on the table. And the truth about mentorship, Christian mentorship, is that that's the way it's got to be approached. You've got to be an open book to that person and you've got to be willing to receive what they give. Because the thing when it comes to battling sin, you call it pride. It has to be dealt with directly. Not evasive, but directly. You have to have someone that speaks to you in that regard. And there are many people in this church that I've had the privilege of serving with for the last year and a half that are more than qualified to sit down and have these conversations with you. So I encourage you that if you do not have that relationship, talk to Asa, talk to one of our elders. It may not be one of them that you pair up with, but get into one of those type of relationships so that you can grow in the Word and in your Christian walk and and to avoid pride from affecting your decisions. Now, when you hear that advice, I'm not going to tell you to go run off and do it. Because then you need to pray on it. You need to listen and pray and just dwell on it. Make that decision based on your prayers because... Sometimes we give bad advice. Sometimes it's not always right. We're human. But at the same time, just pray on it. Because I, I've, I've had many cases where I've had good advice. It's logical. And it, it, for those of you that have been around me, I'm an A-type personality. I am logical to a fault. I am analytical. And so I can sit here and I can rationalize. If I can rationalize it, it's a good thing. But then the next thing I do is I take that next step and I pray on it. And then it doesn't sit right. Something may, whatever it is, it may be, that's not the direction God wants me to go. So make sure your prayer is an integral part of of that, uh, your buffer against pride, your, that, to to keep you from uh, letting pride take over. (laughs) This, this one is, uh, it's an ugly word in our culture, I'll admit, which is accountability. Accountability for your actions. Accountability for your decisions. We are a country, unfortunately, that has moved to this thing where it's somebody else's fault. You see it way too often in the headlines. You see it too often in personal conversations. Well, so-and-so did this. Well, that's fine, but what did you do? Hold yourself accountable for your decisions. Follow through these previous steps of finding godly counsel. Read the Scriptures. Pray on things. But then allow that mentor to hold you accountable to meeting, to following through with those decisions. Because if you're not going to hold yourself accountable to your actions, what good are, what what can you do? It's pride will just, again, if you're not allowing other people to talk to you, pride sets in. It says that I'm smarter, I'm better, I can do more on my own. I can look around this room right now and see wisdom from people that I have met over the course of my 20 plus years here in Hammond, that at some point they spoke into my life, whether it be in business dealings or here in ministry, that to move past personal pride. And look, you kind of, we're all guilty of it. We get zeroed in on what we want to do. But what we've got to do is to be aware of that seeping in into our decision making throughout that Pride is extremely dangerous. And, and that's, for many of us, we identify pride with, well, I'm prideful over uh, my bank account. I'm prideful over my education, the car I drive, physical things, right? You know, those are things that we mostly identify pride to. But let's, let, me, let, me, let me poke a little bit here. What about your spiritual gifts? Are you prideful of that? Are you prideful of the service that you give to the church? I know for me, there was a time when I had first come back, I was in the music program at the church I was at. There were many times I had to be very careful about, I knew better because I sang so great or did so great with that gift that God had given me. 
And there were many times that God would just sit there and go, yeah, you sit right here. <laughs> we got somebody else to fill that role. And the key thing is, is that even in church, even in our congregation, even within your own ministry, pride can go in there. So I urge you to be my, don't, don't just focus on those physical things that people often do. Focus also within your own ministry right here at Crossroads or wherever you may go to church if you're here visiting. But do not hesitate to use those gifts. Just be aware of where pride can seep in and it, it counters all the good that your ministry may do. You've got so many other op- uh, opportunities to where your role at church can be a positive. Just safeguard yourself in that regard. And I think the biggest thing that we can get from this passage here in Isaiah, even amid all that destruction, all the talk of the pride and, and insolence, you know, that powerful word that was discussed both in Isaiah and Jeremiah, that, that they were guilty of the guilt that this country, this nation of Moab had toward God. The thing for us to keep in mind is God is sovereign and He still loves you. And yesterday as I was doing my final read-through, I've done my best for the last week to stay off of Facebook because we've had a heck of a Facebook week, right? All the news, our newspaper for those of you that don't use Facebook. For many of us, it's been depressing. But the one thing, the one thing that just stuck with me, and, I, and there's a bunch of topics, I'm not going to get into them here, but the main thing it hit me was I finally sat back, took that step back, and I said, you know what? One thing hasn't changed. One thing has not changed. God is still in control. And the thing is, is what has happened is that because we panic, we see all this potential negative things going on, our pride steps in and says, I've lost control. But the bottom line is God Hasn't. And there are things that will happen. There are things that will go on that we may not understand, that we don't comprehend. But the bottom line is, is that God is in control. And He is going to move in history. Here's the great thing. You don't need a DVR to find out how this ends. It's right here. Okay? It's right here. And yes, we're going to suffer. Yes, we're going to experience heartache. That is almost, well, it is promised in Scripture. As believers, we are still going to, you know, we have this eternal hope in a heavenly Father. But the thing is, is we still have things that happen in life because of the sinful nature of this world. Illness, death, hardship, loss of jobs, all this kind of stuff happens. But God is in control. And it is on us to avoid sinful attitudes of pride to sit here and say, oh, the end of the world's coming. That's saying that we actually have control of this. If the bottom line is that God is in control, God has a plan, we have to put our pride aside. We have to humble ourselves and say, you know what? I don't know about this current event or that one. But I believe in God. And I'm going to keep moving on. Keep moving forward. Uh, A saying, I was kind of hoping he was going to be here today. uh, But uh, Lonnie Wanscombe always says, you got to keep the main thing the main thing. And sometimes you just got to put on the blinders on like a racehorse. And you just got to understand that we we have one goal which is to bring glory to God and to expand His kingdom, sharing the name of Jesus with everyone that we come in touch with. That is our main purpose. That is what we should concentrate on and not headline news that in 48 hours will be something totally different, no matter how big the event. So I pray that as we look at how these Mo- the, the destruction of the Moabites, that we, that we, like God, we feel the suffering that they went through. But we comprehend and we see that it, the, the source of it was pride. It was their 
desire, their false, their worship of false idols, they're thinking they could control things. And I pray as we move forward in these times that we focus on God, not in our own devices, not in the things that we try to push, but we keep on moving on toward Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today and thank you for God, I, I, th- I thank you for your plan because without it, we would have no purpose. You are in control of all things. And, and God, for any, chance, any times that we put ourselves in front of that, we humbly repent. We humbly come to you looking for guidance. And, and while there are many things in our world these days that, quite honestly, I don't understand But the thing is, is the one thing I do understand is that I find my trust in you. I hope that we, as a family of believers, continue to focus on the Word of God and the direction and the purpose that it provides to us as worshipers and to you and to bring glory to you in everything that we do. That we prevent all these things from distracting us from that purpose. In your name we pray. Amen.